So for tonight, it's a great pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers, Robert Hammond and Lisa Swicken, who will discuss the Highline Project in New York. I don't want to belabor you with a description of it because um, if, you've, if you've been or if you know someone who has been, it's really a space that really needs to be experienced to really be appreciated and they will have uh, much more to say about it and to show you about it. Um, but the High Line was an obvious choice for us in this discussion of 21st century parks, particularly within an urban context. Um, we really think it's one of the shining examples, the stellar examples of what um, of how a project can come into being, and particularly projects that aren't necessarily planned by governmental agencies, but rather are inspired by the community at large. Um, to tell us more about the Highline tonight, we have two uh, concurrent speakers. I'd like to introduce, um, well, they're not in this order, but <laughs> in reverse order, I'll introduce Lisa Swicken first. Lisa is the project manager and lead designer from James Corner Field Operations, which is the firm in charge of landscape architecture for the Highline. And they worked with architects Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro on this 19-block, $150 million project. As an associate principal of the firm, Lisa is working on a, a new 4,500-acre urban park in Memphis, a new public pier on the central Delaware Riverfront in Philadelphia, and the South Street Seaport, a nine-acre mixed-use development in downtown Manhattan with shop architects, the master plan for Fresh Kills Park, among many other projects. The recipient of numerous honors and awards, she was awarded the prestigious Rome Prize in Landscape Architecture at the American Academy of Rome, um, in Rome sorry, in 2007. And joining Lisa will be uh, someone she worked a great, uh, uh, spent a great deal of time with in the development of the project, the Highline, who is Robert Hammond, who is co-founder and executive director of Friends of the Highline. Robert was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, which you might have gleaned if you heard him on the radio this morning, <laughs> and a fan of Big Ben Park. <laughs> Uh, but has also lived, of course, in the West Village since 1994. A graduate of Princeton University, Robert has worked as a consultant for various entrepreneurial endeavors and nonprofits, including the Times Square Alliance, Alliance for the Arts, and the National Cooperative Bank. From 2002 to 2005, he served as an ex officio trustee of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Robert is also a self-taught artist and was recently awarded, also awarded the Rome Prize um, from the American Academy in Rome. So would you please help me welcome first Robert Hammond to be followed by Lisa. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you for, for having me here. I've, I've, I came uh, two days ago because I wanted to sort of see the city a little bit and I, I love it here. I feel like y'all need to come to New York and teach us you know, what to do right. I, uh, I actually rode my bike here on your nice bike program from the hotel and went around on it. It was, uh, you know, amazing, amazing. But my mother wouldn't be happy because you don't have bike helmets. Um, so I'm going to give you just a little bit of overview on what the High Line is, a little bit of, of history about the High Line, about our project, um, talk a little bit about the economics behind it, about how we, how we picked uh, Lisa and, and her team to design it. Um, so the High Line is a mile and a half long. It's an elevated railroad right on the west side of Manhattan. Currently runs from Gansevoort all the way up to 34th Street. But the High Line, it, used to, it was originally a freight line. Um, it wasn't a subway, it wasn't an old L. And the subways ran down on uh, 10th Avenue, I mean the trains, and it was called Death Avenue because so many people were run over by the confluence of, of the trains and the carts. And, the, and so um, they, they actually got a guy on horseback to run in front of the trains, and he was called the West Side Cowboy. And this picture was taken in 1934. You can see the High Line had actually just been completed. But it didn't really help. About a person a month was still, still killed. So they elevated it. Um, and it was built, uh, it was a Robert Moses uh, project. Um, built in the 1930s, finished in 1934, and it basically elevated it off the street. Um, you can see it here, and it, and it served the warehouses in the neighborhood. It was um, often called the lifeline of New York because it, it brought primarily uh, food uh, into the city. And here you can see it went through some buildings. Um, this is an advertisement for you know, wanting to use the line of all the you know, food coming in. Um, 
one of the, oh, the reason I showed this, you can see the Unida Bakers, those two buildings right there that it serviced, which is now Chelsea Market, was the old Nabisco factory right, right in, uh, in Chelsea. So um, fast forward, it was last used in 1980, a tr trainload of frozen turkeys left the meat market in, in around Thanksgiving. And then it was a, a basically abandoned, and wildflowers grew up on it. Um, and no one had used it. And when I first, I live uh, in the West Village, and I'd sort of seen it, but didn't really know what it was. This is what I saw, just, you know, the structure from below. And I loved sort of this industrial, you know, relic or, or ruin. Um, but then I, I read an article in the Times that said it was going to be demolished. And I thought um, someone must be doing something to preserve it, some civic group. And, you know, called around. No one was doing anything. Um, I heard it was going to be on the agenda at a community board meeting. And I'd never been to a community board meeting, never had wanted to go, and still don't really want to go after, go <laughs> after going to, you know, 100 maybe now at this point. But um, I went and I sat next to another guy uh, who I didn't know who lived in Chelsea. And um, he, we were the only two people in the meeting that was interested. So we exchanged business cards. And, you know, I said, I'm really busy. Why don't you start it? And he said, well, I'm busy. You do it. And we decided to do it together. And, uh, you know, we... That, that was sort of the, the origin of it back in the summer of 1999. Um, at the time, most people were, were against it, um, and definitely most people thought it was very unlikely. But, you know, and, I, and it's great, I get these great introductions and I get a lot of credit for doing this, but I think the most important thing we really did was raise the flag, um, and it allowed other people to come along and help us accomplish that. And I'll talk about some of the things that we did and that other people helped us to do to make it happen. But a, an important uh, distinction from other, pres someone called me a preservationist, and I, I, don't, I don't even really like that term. Because um, to me, preservation is just about stopping, you know, maybe stopping demolition or stopping decay. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to stop it from being demolished and create a new use, you know, come up with sort of new ideas for it. Um, and so that, and that's why we started Friends of the High Line. Um, we also didn't really have a, we had a vision, but it was just a broad vision. It was just, let's, let's do something with it. Um, we, didn't have, we, we didn't know exactly what we wanted to do, and we definitely didn't have a plan or any money at first. Um, you know, a lot of people assume we had this grand plan of how we were going to do it. If someone had told me, you know, look, you're going to have to raise $150 million, I probably wouldn't have, <laughs> wouldn't have done it. <laughs> um, but, you know, what, what we did have is we had a mile and a half in Manhattan, and that, that was my elevator, you know, my 15-second second elevator pitch is, look, there's a mile and a half in Manhattan. How often does a city like New York get that? Um, and, you know, one of the things we did early on was we had a lot of attention to design. And one of the first things we did was have this logo done by Paula Scher at Pentagram. And, um, and, and it was, one, to make it look like we, we had more going on than, than we actually did. <laughs> You know, that if you, wow, what a nice logo, you must not be working out of your apartment to, you know, running a nonprofit. But um, the other thing was a commitment that we weren't just going to uh, save it and, and throw up a bench and a, and a ladder. You know, we were going to, good design was going to follow all the way through um, the project. Um, one of the, the mechanisms we identified early on is rails to trails or rail banking. But contrary to the name of rail banking, there's no money associated with it. You have to raise your own money. But it is a mechanism that has turned 15,000 miles of trails all over the U.S., and I know a lot, you know, in, in this state. Um, this is, um, I guess this was my business plan. You know, this is how I started it. I was just write down people to, to call and ask for advice. And, you know, one of the things I always, is now it's a very popular project and people assume it was always going to happen. But, you know, most people weren't, weren't interested in it in the beginning. But, you know, the critical part is en enough people were and passed me on to people that, that, that were helpful. Um, and one of the things someone suggested was they, they heard of this photographer, Joel Sternfeld, who was, I, I didn't know him. I called him, I looked him up in information and he brought him up and he said, look, I love it. Give me a year and I'll give you great photos. And he went up there over the course of the year and took these incredible photographs. And it was one of the most powerful tools we had was these, these, these visual images um, that did a much better job of telling people about the potential than I ever could, you know, is, is showing these and let people imagine, um, you know, what they want. And we published a book called Walking the High Line. It's just 
uh, we just republished it because it went it went out of uh, print, and uh, you can get it on our website, thehighline.org. But it's it's a beautiful, and then these these really became a symbol of of what we were fighting for. Um, but pretty quick, we had a, the opposition. Uh, rallied against us, a group of developers that owned property underneath it wanted to tear it down and they got a hold of one of our mailing lists. We thanked all of our donors in, a, in, in something we did and they started mailing. They would send this uh, Highline reality, with reality crumbling, um, every, every week and uh, this one. But you know, we quickly realized this was, this was helpful to us because it actually got, kept us kept us, you know, sort of front of mind. And again, you know, the, the most powerful thing is for people to make up their own mind. And, you know, one, I would never want to put the swing set on the High Line, but two, it actually, it, it, it would fit. It, it did fit on the High Line if we'd wanted to. <laughs> the other thing that I realized that was actually very helpful was, was Mayor Giuliani. He hated the High Line. He, in, in the, the day before he la left office, he signed the demolition order. And again, I, I quickly realized that, you know, these seemingly mighty opponents can also be huge assets because if I couldn't convince anybody of the project, you know, they didn't care about the Joel Sternfeld or that it's a once in a lifetime opportunity, I would say, well, Giuliani hates it. And they would be like, oh, well, then it must be a smart idea. <laughs> and um, so, we, you know, since he wasn't a fan, we did, we went around and building different constituencies. Um, the, com the, the community, and most of these people actually in the very beginning weren't in favor of it, but we knew we needed to convince each one of these. Even a lot of people in the community sort of saw it as old and rusty. Developers thought it was an impediment to development, and the city thought it was, you know, under, under Giuliani thought it was a blight. Um, and we also, so, so the, none, none of them were really excited about it first, so we sort of ended up creating our own constituents which were artists, architects, a lot of small business owners that had been attracted to the neighborhood, and a lot of new and young residents. Whenever we were on the agenda at the community board, you know, the average age of the community board dropped about two decades. And, you know, it was something great. The community board loved it because it got people involved in the, in the process people, per, you know, didn't really know about. Um, Mayor Bloomberg, when he came in office, he was much more open-minded to this, was open to it, but he also was skeptical. It was after 9-11, the city was, you know, in, in tough financial straits. And um, so we made a, a financial argument to him that, you know, we, we did, weren't going to show him the Joel Sternfeld photos. We said, look, um, if we can prove that over a 20-year time period, the capitalized value of incremental uh, real estate taxes that we could attribute to the High Line is greater than the cost, does, does that make sense? Um, so we hired a, a firm, HRNA, that does these financial feasibility studies. And you know, the best example in New York of a park's creating value is Central Park. But at the time, who was gonna, how could you possibly compare this to, you know, giant, wonderful Central Park? So we looked at these small pocket parks that add anywhere between 6 and 13 percent in incremental value uh, two blocks away from the park. Um, and we met with a lot of, of real estate marketers and they said the, the way you're going to create the most value is if you can create a park that creates a district. So people, you know, a neighborhood people want to live in, work in, visit, and call it the High Line neighborhood. Um, and this is a map that we had actually our graphic uh, designer, she did for us, of all the businesses and sort of things in the neighborhood to try to help people think about it, um, you know, all knit together. Um, and this has actually come true far beyond that we thought. Um, so we, we projected it would bring into the city about $250 million and cost about $100 million to, to, to build. Um, it, it's, we were wildly under in both. Um, it cost about $150 million to build. And the city just redid what they think it'll bring in in revenues over 20, year, uh, 20 years, and it's about $900 million. Um, and that doesn't count all the just incremental, it's already generated, they think, except, you know, um, I can't, I can't remember, it was over a billion dollars in just current development that's already happened. But, so Bloomberg got on board, but we still didn't have any money, we still didn't have approvals, we still were fighting the developers. And so we did an ideas competition, and that's what I think is so excited about what y'all are thinking about doing here, is as a way of getting people to think about the opportunities without being constrained to reality like this. And this was my favorite, this was one of the winners, was a mile long lap pool. Um, and you know, to me I still think, I mean I love, I love what field operation did, but I, I have to say this would have been pretty good too. You know. 
So, um, and you know, people did all different. We had a 720 entries. It was the largest design competition uh, in the world at the time before the World Trade Center competition. Um, 30, I think 36 countries entered. This one was from Russia, you know, and this one was more of a political manifesto, you know, <laughs> make it a park, prison, pool. Um, this one taking more just, you know, on high, I think. Um, this one, another one of my favorites was a roller coaster and you could leave it untouched, but then you would go up and see in people's bedrooms and, um, this was, and this was really interesting. This was, this was one of the things that helped us is, you know, thinking about it for programming. So not thinking about design, but thinking about what you would do on the High Line and around it. And, you know, again, thinking about, you know, how, um, how you would program it. And now we have a programming calendar, um, you know, that's not that dissimilar from, from this. Um, and we did, the, we did an exhibition of all the entries in Grand Central um, to try to make, to, to not think of it as a local project. It wasn't just about the neighborhood. And that's what, another thing I think is interesting, the way y'all are thinking about it. It's not a group doing just a park in one neighborhood, but thinking about it as a citywide sort of problem and, and opportunity. Um, and it, this also helped just create awareness for the project. We did a lot of community um, input and engagement. We've had over two dozen community input sessions. I mean, Lisa, I don't know how many Lisa we made her go to. Um, but, you know, because Josh and I, uh, the co-founder, we never wanted to say this is just our idea. This is what it has to be, be like. So we always would go back to the community and, and get their input. Um, we also did, because I personally thought it would take, I don't know, several decades to have this done, we wanted to involve people in the pro process, you know, throughout. So we, we started an education program back in 2001. Um, the neighborhood it runs through is also has a lot of, of low-income housing, permanent um, uh, low-income. So it's an interesting issue where gentrification doesn't really push. It's, it's, gonna, it's a neighborhood of actually very poor and very rich. Um, and so one of the things, we wanted to make it a park for everyone. So, you know, we, we've started and now we've expanded this education program. But we, we started it even before we had a park to do it in. I think that's something. We also did programming before we owned the park. Um, and we did this with The Kitchen, which is an arts organization right next to the High Line. Um, this is our programming calendar. So, you know, it's, it's continued, but, you know, it, it's, it's, it doesn't have to start, you know, necessarily in the park. And we had artists <clears throat> re-envision what they would do in a street fair. We're in New York, you know, in street fair, they sell socks and those bamboo things. And so this was the chance for artists to sort of rethink what they would do there, and it was all free. Um, and now we have a lot of our programming is free and actually Target is one of our big um, underwriters. They're underwriting an arts program we're doing um, next month. And if you come, you know, check out our website and see what's, what's happening. We give talks and tours. Um, something else that was a little different about us is that we were very pro-business, whereas a lot of community groups or preservation groups tend to be sort of anti-business. Even though we were sometimes fighting developers, you know, we always... We, we didn't feel anti-development, um, and we always promoted the economic benefits. This is a map that we created of local businesses that we handed out at the exhibition in Grand Central to sort of help the businesses near the High Line and sort of help people clue in. The High Line could connect all these things together, even, you know, b before it was open. Um, and, you know, again, you know, we're a, we're a private group. Friends of the High Line is, is independent. We don't work for the city, but we partnered with the city, and this, this project could have never happened if we didn't get the support of our elected officials. And, and we work with them, you know, in addition to the mayor, Hillary Clinton, um, our local city councilwoman, Christine Quinn, um, our, uh, Chuck Schumer, Jerry Nadler. I, love, I also love this photo because um, none of them are looking at each other. Like... <laughs> It's not, I think it's something you learn and when you're a politician, you don't have to look at, you, look, you don't look at the other politicians. Um, and, you know, once we had the support, actually, and the woman, uh, Amanda Burden, the, the pretty woman with the, with the blonde hair there, um, was, is our planning commissioner. And she helped. One of the problems was how do you convince these developers that, you know, it's good to have a railroad track where you can't develop your, your property. So we use something called a transfer of development rights. It's only been in, used in New York three times. It was first used to save Grand Central. They allowed the railroad, which is sort of ironic, and Grand Central is named after the Central Railroad that built the High Line, um, 
to transfer their development rights within within the neighborhood to save it from being demolished. It was part of uh, Jackie O's campaign. I mean, Jackie O tr campaigned to stop it, but this was sort of the actual zoning mechanism that actually happened. Um, they also used it to save a lot of the theaters uh, more recently in the 90s in around Times Square. Um, and so how it works is uh, the developers, normally you can only transfer development rights to an adjacent property. In this case, you can transfer it anywhere in the neighborhood. So it got us to stop having to, to fight the developers. They were First we were suing them to stop it from being demolished and then they were suing us to st stop it from being built. Um, and that got them on, on, on board. And it's really created a boom in uh, projects around. Over 40 projects um, have gone up or are still going up and a lot of them are you know, still on track even in this climate. I'm just gonna run through a few. Uh, the Whitney is gonna build their major new museum. They'll probably, um, it, it, it'll replace the, the, uh, the Madison Avenue Breuer um, Museum. It'll be about 200,000 square feet. They'll be able to show more of their collection. It's, it's be being designed by Renzo Piano. They hope to break ground next year on that. Um, uh, Jim Polshek uh, did this, this standard hotel that actually straddles the High Line. Um, uh, Barry Diller's uh, headquarters, he's, he's actually our largest, he and his wife, uh, Diamond Furstenberger, our largest donors. His headquarters was designed by Frank Gehry. This is a new one. This is actually a rendering now. It's actually up, uh, designed by uh, your own architect um, that's done a great building here, Jean Nouvelle. Um, and this is a, my favorite building done by a younger architect named Neil Denari from LA. And it's actually done too. I just haven't updated that. Um, and you know, when I say we're a private group, there is a, there's a precedent for that in New York called a Conservancy Model Central Park was the first one to, to do that. And we're a private group. Um, we, we have a license agreement with the city. So the city actually owns the High Line. It was donated by CSX, the railroad. And we have a license agreement to manage and operate it under the jurisdiction of the Parks Department. So we can't do whatever we want. Um, it has all the same rules as a normal city park. It's free. Um, but we pay all of the staff. So if, if you go visit and you see a gardener or you see a maintenance worker or a bathroom attendant, there are employees. Um, the city's responsible, responsible for the legal liability um, and the security, and we're responsible for everything else. Um, I, this is just always, this is the interesting thing to me. I don't know, you know, is how we actually, where the money actually came from. Um, we, the private group, we raised $50 million for the, uh, for the construction, for the capital, um, and the city and federal government put in put in um, the rest, um, and then we pay about 3.5 million annually, and the city puts in about uh, a little over a half a million every year for annual maintenance. So we have to raise that every year. Um, and if you want to uh, if you want to help us, you can become a member um, on our website, um, and you get you know certain benefits. Um, there's also, we've done a lot to try to make it sustainable. I know Lisa will probably talk about this. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this about why, how it tried to be. I mean, the, the, the most important reason I think it's sustainable is, you know, it's great if you build a LEED certified building, but the best thing you can do is actually just reuse an old building <laughs> rather than building a new one. And to me, you know, it's in addition to being sort of the longest green roof in Manhattan, uh, you know, it's it's to me, it's just sort of recycling on a on a grand scale. Um, we also do a lot with art on it, since we're speaking here at the Walker, which is such a great museum. I I've, I was um, I've taken all their programming stuff because I want to knock it off. It's just so good. Everything they do here is just great. It makes me feel jealous of our graphics. Um, and this is a project we open with by the uh, artist Spencer Finch. Um, we collaborated with Creative Time, which is an art group in New York, and it was um, 720 different panes of glass of different blues, and it was inspired by uh, different photographs of the Hudson River. Um, and then we do a lot of smaller um, arts programs. We had a, a donor named Donald Mullen who said, look, I want to give you money to do small arts projects, and this was called Specials. And on one side, it was a sort of a gallery wall where art was hanging, and on the other side, it was a taco stand, and they made tacos and gave free tacos. Um, so that's like the art side, and there was the taco side. Um, and it was homemade tortillas, they were very good. 
Um, this is something we did uh, with Text of Light, and we had, we showed these uh, the silent film from from Germany, where and we had these musicians playing. It was part of a pro forma. Um, per, I don't know, a, a performance um, festival this fall. Uh, this is a great piece. It's an old, it's, it looks like a Hudson River Valley um, painting that's sort of decaying <laughs> right on the High Line. It's up there. It's been, I think it's going to be up for another few months um, by Valerie Haggerty. This is a, a piece that's going to uh, debut next on Wednesday, uh, which is a sound piece by Stephen Vitiello. And this is the one I'm most excited about. Because there used to be billboards all over the High Line, and there's still billboards around it. So this is an artist, Kim Beck, who creates um, what looks like a billboard. It's actually flat and just built out of, and we're going to put seven of them around adjacent buildings. Um, the other thing is, and Lisa's going to walk you through all the design of Section 1, Section 2. Um, one of the things that we're still working on, it, and Section 2 is paid for. It's going to open probably... Uh, about this time next year in 2011. Section three, where it goes around this rail yard is, is still um, what we're working on preserving and make sure um, we keep. Um, and it's where there, right now there's plans for 12 million square feet of development on that site. So about two times downtown Seattle um, in this one site. And there's still, um, the developer that, ha controls it is, is not convinced that the whole high line should stay still. So that's something that's, that we're really advocating um, for. Um, I'm just really quickly, someone, people were asking what, what I was doing. I'm still, uh, I'll go back to Rome. I still have another month uh, in Rome. And one of the projects I worked on there was trying to revitalize the Tiber River, which is this walkway that runs along the Tiber that's sort of unused. And so I, I tried an experiment. What happens if you put 100 movable chairs down there and you know, would it would it activate the space? And I was doing this a few weeks ago, and it and it it did. We also tried it at the Maxi Museum, Zaha Hadid's museum, which has this sort of forlorn uh, plot, piazza out in the front. And so we tried the chairs there, and um, it also sort of worked. <laughs> um, um, and then right before I segue, you know, turn this over to Lisa. Um, after we did our ideas competition, we had raised a little more money, we'd gotten a little more progress, and so it was time to pick a designer. So speaking of Zaha Hadid, we did an actual design competition to, to pick a designer for, for the High Line. And we had four finalist uh, teams. Um, Zaha Hadid, uh, this was her plan, and I asked her in the interview, I said, well, I, you know, it's interesting, there's no plants. It's, um, you know, it's a park, and, and she said, um, <laughs> She said, uh, she said, well, plants are things that architects put when they don't know what else to do with the space. And I'm actually a fan of hers. I just realized it wasn't a fit, you know, for, <laughs> for us. And in case you thought that was plants, that's AstroTurf in the green, so not plants. Um, Terragram, led by um, Julie Bargman and Michael Van Balkenberg, um, had a lot of plants. It was actually a beautiful, beautiful plan. Um, and then Stephen Hall and George Hargraves, which was much more of an architectural um, scheme. This was his idea for underneath, which I actually always liked this. Um, but the real, um, I mean, from when I first heard uh, James Corner and, and Rick Zafidio and Liz Diller, you know, pitch us from the very first interview, I, I was sold. Um, and at the time, they didn't, neither one of them had a lot of built work. Um, we were like, oh, well, let's go visit things that they had built but there was nothing to go visit. Um, but it was just, they, they, they captured the dilemma of how do you keep, you know, you saw in those Joel Sternfelds, that magical feeling, but yet making it a public park. And, you know, this was one of, the, one of their entries. And what's so exciting is this is actually what's being built right now. And, uh, you know, I feel so lucky to have, uh, have worked with them. And, you know, I think in a large part, thanks to them, we, we've had over two, two million people already visit um, the part that's open um, so far. It's about five times, you know, what we ever expected. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thanks, Robert. I usually think that I have the fun job, but you kind of made that really fun. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take off from 
where Robert left off really talking about the design, but I wanted to quickly just mention because of the context of the next generation of Parch Parks lecture series, I thought it'd be important to briefly mention a few large parks around the world that James Corner Field Operations is currently designing. And this one, um, Fresh Kills Landfill is 2,200 acres. The High Line, all three sections is about six acres, just to give you a sort of number there. And as most of you know, this is one of the world's largest sanitary landfills. And it's currently being converted into a new public park. But it's a new type of park. The park is really something that is supposed to kind of have seed farms, tree farms, composting at the same time as large-scale urban wilderness programs such as um, boating and urban camping and um, even doing cross-country skiing, etc. Shelby Farms Park in Memphis, Tennessee is now 4,500 acres. Um, so this is enormous. It's about five times the size of Central Park. And this was one of the country's first penal farms. Um, there is still a small prison on the site, and you actually see um, some of the prisoners engaged in gardening. But the idea of this park is really, it's one of, it will be one of the largest urban parks, and it has a focus on agriculture, sustainable food production. There's actually an existing bison range on the, in the park. Um, there's an agricultural research center. Um, a huge woodland restoration initiative. You can see all of the trees that you're seeing there is new forest connecting to the Wolf River on the southern section of the site, which goes directly into the Mississippi. Um, there's a huge portion of the site that's dedicated to fitness. Um, Memphis is one of cities that has a big issue with obesity. So the idea of big landscape activities for boating, horseback riding, biking, running, et cetera, is something that's very important there. And this is one of the early images of the lake, which is actually, we're expanding the current lake there by two. Just the lake itself is over two acres. Lake Ontario Park, which is a park that we're working on in Toronto. Um, the city of Toronto, like yourselves, is actually looking at redeveloping their entire waterfront in many phases. Some of the phases have started, um, but they're looking at the entire post-industrial waterfront. This is something that is actually called the spit and it's made from dredging material. But now, of course, there's a conservation group that are friends of the spit, <laughs> and they want to you know, preserve this as an ecological sort of place. Um, but this park is really about an edge condition, and you can see it in this picture. So we're designing it with a series of kind of beaches, trails, outposts, these sort of lonely island experiences out on the water that's very different from your typical kind of waterfront bulkhead edge park. And this is one of the images um, where you can see the idea of some of these outposts. Um, here, connectivity is also um, a huge part, so there are some substantial links where you're actually linking islands to other islands. Guangzhou Lakeside Park is a park that we're working on in Korea. Um, and this is a new urban development. Um, there's a lot of cities, like large cities, that spring up there that's kind of amazing. And this has two lakes that had incredible difficulty with water quality. So one of the things that this design focuses on is actually making filtration machines that actually function as both public space and cleaning water. And here you can see the ideas for that um, type of water filtration. So using you know, pretty standard mechanisms, terracing, um, wetland filtration, uh, moving waters through, dropping out sediments, things like that, but doing it in a way where it's not just an engineering maneuver, but it actually becomes a viable amenity. Great Falls Park is a park that we're working on in New Jersey. Um, this actually was just recently moved to a national parks register. And there's some amazing, you can see the falls right there, assets um, in this park, but it was largely an old abandoned steel mill on the water. So the idea here is a very light, sensitive touch, um, creating a loop that actually connects all of the different resources, um, both natural as well as some of the great um, kind of industrial relics that are in the site. Um, and again, it has a similar, that similar sort of sensitivity that the High Line has where you're really trying to somehow um, figure out what is that preservation versus transformation and how much do you leave and how much do you actually design. 
The University of Puerto Rico Botanical Garden, um, this is a project in San Juan, and there's a large river. This, the river that you see that's going through the middle of the site was actually channelized. The idea that we had was actually to daylight the river. And this, this not only became um, the focus of the botanical garden, because it was the center of the park, but it was actually an organizational device for the botanical garden. So we started assembling species according to wet and dry, moving from the river up to the mountains. Um, the Ray Street Pier is a, it's a small project, but it has a very big impact. Um, this is in Philadelphia. You can see there's a large expressway that cuts off the waterfront from the city, although this site is only two blocks from Old City. Um, and it's right underneath the Ben Franklin Bridge. It's fantastic. The Delaware River is an enormous river, and when you get out to the end of it, you sort of can see all the way north, all the way south. Um, on the Philadelphia side, it's actually very interesting because there's all of these piers. We're on the other side of the river, which is Camden, New Jersey. It's just a straight bulkhead, and there actually aren't any piers. So the city is looking to develop the entire waterfront, and the first project is the Ray Street Pier. Um, the design right now is almost finished. We're, in, we're finalizing construction drawings. It's basically the, the entire pier is split into an upper level and a lower level. The upper level um, goes, when you get to the very end, you're about 15 feet above the water with a view back into the city skyline. The lower level has much more sort of planting lawn areas. Between the two levels, there's a terrace that negotiates the level change that you can sit on. Then finally, two very new projects in the office, the Atlanta Beltline, which I'm sure um, was influenced the client there by our work on the High Line. The city of Atlanta for the last about 12 years has been rethinking um, what they're calling the Beltline, which is a 22 mile loop around the entire city reusing old embankments, trailways, elevated rail lines, and connecting them all. And in addition, they're looking to establish a light rail that will go around the whole city. It's a pretty, pretty impressive um, initiative. And here you can see just the context of, of some of the, those areas. Some of them are very industrial, some of them go right through neighborhoods. So it has a very different effect and it will likely change um, as it moves. It won't be something where the High Line had a sort of consistent line. This is one that will likely be, be varied significantly. And finally, the Civic Center Park in Santa Monica, California, which is a seven acre site. Um, it actually connects uh, City Hall, which is what you can see the building just inland from the beach to the historic Santa Monica Pier. Um, this right now is a big asphalt parking lot. So it's pretty amazing when you actually begin to look into cities and see what is there, what isn't being used, what could be used both temporarily, as in something even like Robert showed on the Tiber, and then things that actually can become permanent parks. And finally, the High Line. So the High Line for us, um, you know, I always like to kind of start with two images. Um, this one, because you really see the intimate scale of the High Line. And the rail tracks, you know, on standard are about five feet on center. The minimum width of the High Line is approximately 30 feet wide. So why it could fit that small playground that Robert was showing earlier, it's pretty narrow. Um, you know, your, your streets outside are usually larger streets 60 feet wide. And then the next image um, I also like to show because the High Line functions at this scale too, where it's actually cutting through the city, has views of the city, um, just being raised 30 feet above the ground gives you an entirely new perspective. And it's amazing to me that people come up there, both tourists who know New York through icons and can pick them out, um, residents who actually see the city in a totally new way, and just from that experience of kind of walking uninterrupted for a mile and a half in the city, hovering over intersections um, and being able to sort of see things, it's an entirely new perspective. So when we first got the project, I mean, one of our biggest things was don't, don't screw it up. Um, section one, section two, section three, Robert already sort of covered. Um, section one is the piece that's open right now. You can see in this drawing, it actually is the least standard 
piece of the High Line, um, as in section two is much more simple. It's, a, it's very narrow, it goes right through the mid block. Section one had a series of kind of anomalies where it was wider, it has spurs, it splits into two different levels, it goes underneath buildings. Um, so we had to deal with that early on. And for us, the other kind of question was, you know, this idea that the High Line was actually working for, as, a, as an actual working rail line for about the same amount of time that it was abandoned. And, you know, it's always a question of what do you draw inspiration from, um, not that it has to be one or the other. And in this case, we always saw it as this kind of corridor, a transit corridor of sorts, whether it's for people, plants, or whether it's for trains, doesn't matter. And at the same time, this kind of green ribbon that went through the sky that most people only knew about if they were attached to the High Line or they had snuck into the High Line. So one of the first principles that we had, it's, it was very simple, the idea of just keep it. Keep it simple, keep it wild, keep it quiet, keep it slow. And this was a mantra that kind of you know, sat in our head throughout the entire design process. Um, one of the things that we sort of like to say about this project is that in some ways it was actually a form of restraint. Um, this idea of being able to notice what's there, being able to amplify what's there and enhance what's there and choreograph the line so that you actually are enhancing all of these things, but at the same time not over, over designing it and allowing it to sort of become an experience where people can have impromptu um, types of behavior. So keeping the structure was more difficult than just saying keeping the structure. It was all lead paint. It had to be stripped and removed um, in the middle of the city. So this is not a difficult thing to do. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, we had to repair concrete. Um, we had to remove all of the waterproofing and re-waterproof it because there was going to be new fancy galleries, restaurants underneath it, as well as the existing um, businesses that were there. There were some areas that were in very good shape, others that were not. Um, keep it meant to be inspired by the sort of wild self-sown landscape that had grown up there. For us in general, um, a lot of parks sort of have a very limited palette for landscape. There's kind of the turf and tree um, phenomenon. And, you know, we have been working a lot with both, you know, Pete Oldoff was, in, was the um, consultant of ours on this project, but we've been working a lot to sort of begin to expand that palette of what a park can be. And our idea was to use grasses, perennials, things that were reminiscent of this kind of wild landscape, but are also mixed with, you know, quite extraordinary horticultural specimens as well. Keep It also meant this idea of the sort of illicit backside um, quality of the High Line. There was something kind of magical about being mid-block in the city and having the sort of cut through, a section cut, if you will, through the sort of blank walls and billboards and things like this. And with all the new development, you know, most of the new development is turning towards the High Line. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, I think part of the choreography, it's very interesting as you walk down it now because you sort of see both buildings moving away from the High Line, buildings facing the High Line, and you get this um, almost tempo as, as you walk the line. And finally, keep it meant a slow space for us. Um, this is someone, you know, trespassing when it was not open to the public and a few people did that. Um, but the idea that this wasn't going to be a street. We didn't want it to function as a street. We wanted it to be a different kind of space than the street below. And this image is, it's a kind of nothing image, but it had a great deal of inspiration because the idea was that there was a surface that had sort of created itself on the High Line and this was matted with, you know, steel, concrete, moss, plants, um, everything had sort of come together to form a surface. And in the initial competition, our idea was creating a new surface. And one of the biggest problems was, what do you do with the path? Because the High Line, if it's only 30 feet wide and a typical standard path width is 10 feet wide, a third of the line is eaten up by just your path. So the idea really was this idea for a new surface that was a mix of hard and soft materials and had variations of those materials and created a singular surface um, so that you were actually able to experience the High Line as a whole and not just have a kind of path next to a typical curb next to a planting bed. 
and these are images from the competition and it is it's always fun to look at these and then see the the built images right after them because they are quite similar and that's impressive especially knowing what what we had to do to make some of those decisions i think the first two years i was in city hall at least two days a week i would guess um so we had to sort of figure out okay we have this minimum width and then you have this minimum depth so you're limited in many ways of what you can do the grass and perennial landscape was also technically the most feasible. Um, there's limited areas where we could build up to get woody species and trees, but for the most part, you only had 18 to 24 inches of soil. Um, and then sort of figuring out having you know a single person, a person sitting on a bench, wheelchairs going side by side, et cetera. This was all a big part of the decision. And then also looking at the structural below. This is uh, one of the drawings of the structural plan and you can see how all the beams are working. And the paving was actually designed to work with the structure below and expand and contract with the structure below. These were some of the early models um, looking at that kind of variegated edge um, where we have what we call the signature taper plan planks and how they actually move up and move into the planting beds. This was not only to kind of blur the boundary between the hard and the soft materials, but it was also functioning to push water from the pathways into the planting beds. And it also integrated the existing rail tracks. Because we were in New York, we were lucky. We could sort of make a million mock-ups, go chalk up things on the High Line itself, test it for scale. Um, these were things that, that we did throughout the design process. So the final paving design, and, and I sort of, I dislike calling it paving because in some ways this was an integrated system. Everything was designed with each other. So the benches, the paving, the planting, it was all designed so that it would have this combed and furrowed effect and work together. Um, but the idea was to have a series of modules. These are the different plank types and that those are formed together. This is an excerpt from the paving plan to create this mosaic of the paving and how it could vary in different areas. And these were you know, done with areas where we wanted to have larger spaces for gathering and then areas where we wanted to have more planting for quieter residential neighborhoods, et cetera. This is a photograph of them installing the paving. It was installed very similar to the way rail rack, uh, railroad tracks are installed. The idea was really to have a series of knee walls and then the plankings went on top of that. And, you know, I, I kind of like to show this image because I feel like it's one of the best compliments you can get. But when I go up on the High Line, a lot of people will say to me, wasn't this already there? And, you know, it, you actually had to strip everything. The entire structure had to be rewaterproofed, redrained, um, painted, patched, etc. And then the new landscape was put on top of that. Um, these are just some of the images of how we worked with the existing rail tracks, integrating them into the paving system. Every single rail track was tagged so that they could be put back in their original locations. Um, they had to, we had to change all of the different ties because of creosote and other hazardous materials, but all the tracks were, were cleaned and put back to their locations. Um, I kind of love this image, although I remember actually Robert saying to us on one of the first days, aren't people just going to walk right into the planting beds? And I don't mind it here, but yes, they do. <laughs> But you can see how the plants have grown up over time, and they really do demarcate an edge at the same time as allowing that kind of more wild effect on the edges. There's a series of blooms. If you go to the High Line, especially now, almost every week, it changes. And a lot of these are sort of dominated by colors. So one of the first colors on the High Line is a blue purple, and it's all of the meadow sages. And then it moves to a pink, which is the astilbe, and then it moves to yellow, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a very different experience. And one of the strong ideas was really to make sure that the planting was choreographed, not only season by season, but almost week by week. And then they all sort of come together um, to form this integrated system where you have the existing tracks, the benches, the plants, the paving, etc. This is just some of the images of how the benches were integrated. The bench was made in two different pieces, a piece that was actually part of the paving system itself, and then a wood kind of top that was slatted in with that. 
and you can see the effect. Sometimes they sort of form flocks uh, for socialization. Other times they're kind of lonely experience where you're actually just looking into the city or looking into the river. They all are underlit. The High Line is a very beautiful place to be at night. As someone, I remember telling me it's, it's way too romantic for New York. <laughs> um, in addition, there's a couple places where we actually, this is the only place where we change the bench, both in its material, it's all wood, and the orientation, because there's a spectacular view to the Statue of Liberty. So all of the different pathways were highly kind of maneuvered um, to allow the body to become into contact with specific views, icons, etc. in the city. And you can see the, the little kind of alcoves that are created um, with the configuration of the benches. And the seating is actually, it's a really, I mean, you know, even with the, the uh, movable chairs that Robert was showing, I mean, it's one of the classic kind of maneuvers for how to create, you know, a public space and really understanding how to, how to place and arrange um, seats for socialization is important. Um, so the planting of the High Line is essentially a full green roof. It has a series of green roof layers. Um, it has a highly engineered soil specification. There's a stone mulch that works with the dry gravel prairie species that we specified. Um, the main idea was really to have a native grass matrix that went through the whole line, and then a series of blooms that were perennials, um, a couple areas where we could have trees and shrubs, etc. And this is just an excerpt from the planting plan, so you can see it's a, one of my favorite drawings, but everything in green is just that native grass matrix, and all the little letters are the names of species and how they bloom and come up. In addition, we had to redrain the entire high line, and because we had to do this anyway, the idea was really to put all of the high points underneath the pathways and the low points in the plants. The entire paving system is open joint, which is rare, but it means that when water basically rains on the high line, it goes through the paving and then is moved to the drainage scheme into the planting beds. So you can serve water. And I think we, I think the facts were something like 80% of the water that falls on the high line actually stays on the high line and is infiltrated into the planting beds. Um, this is an image of that drainage screed layer. It had to be super thin because if you can see on the sides, that parapet wall, that's all you have to plant. So when you see the photographs of the actual planting on the High Line, it's pretty amazing about what, you know, when it tells you something about the adaptability and robustness of, you know, plants in general and specifically some of the species that were selected for, for the High Line. Um, everything had to be craned up. It seems like like uh, something that you don't really think about, but <laughs> there were no access points, so everything had to be craned up, including soils, plants, etc., cetera, um, and laid out onto the site. This is showing the soils coming in. In fact, we contract grew all of the plants, which means that we went to a nursery, we had a contract that was set before we actually um, had the design completed just for the plants, and we grew them from little babies. <laughs> into four inch pots and then these pots were crated up to the line and planted all that drawing you or that image you can see every single one of the four inch pots and then these were arranged on site this and i'm sorry that image too you can see all the pots being arranged on the site and this one too and when we first put it in it was like it was kind of amazing. I remember walking up there and being like, it, it does look like it, it was the existing High Line. And then, of course, you add the people and the meandering movement of the pathways. And I love this image because it really, it just seems like people are just sort of strolling through a meadow and, um, you know, just in the sky. Um, again, images of trees being craned up to site, placed, and the idea that you get these sort of small, this is a um, smoke bush tree that's quite beautiful. It looks like a Dr. Seuss tree in the early spring because it's very hairy. Um, but the idea was to really get unique specimens of trees um, at the same time as do wild specimens of trees that people don't usually associate with a park type of a species. 
The lighting plan was really very simple. The idea was to keep all of the lights below eye level so that you could see the sky and the city um, beyond. And since we had the railings, the major light source was really to attach the light to the railing edge and have that um, provide all the light on the line itself. These are LED fixtures. And you can see the effect at night. They sort of, all the planting beds glow. Um, there's a beautiful design with L'Observatoire, um, who was our lighting consultant for the tunnels. Very simple. It's two light fixtures, a blue one and a white one. And when they go on together, they sort of form this violet color. Or you can also do just blue or just white. And it creates a volume of light in the existing tunnels through the High Line. Um, the access points were very important, obviously. Um, they're about every two blocks. Um, in the beginning, we had to sort of think about how often we wanted access, um, restricting it in some cases. We, we argued a lot for sort of limiting access, not limiting it in terms of making it accessible, but not having access to every single private building next to it, et cetera, because we really wanted this to function as a, as a public park. Um, however, there are access points that are that go through the city um, for approvals that do connect to private buildings, but those were highly managed and they have to be a public access point. So they have to open and close with the park and they are you know, completely public. This is just to show you before, there was a building underneath the very end of the High Line. Um, the vision was to remove the building, clean up the sort of cut at the end of the High Line, and create a slow stair up to the High Line itself. Here you can see that in construction. The end cut was something that happened in the 1960s, I believe, where Everything south of the High Line, it was about six blocks south, um, was demolished. And it was actually a good learning experience for us on the High Line. It was really the only place where we could see how the High Line was built when we were looking at it. And so the idea was to clean up that edge and create this almost, it's like, it's almost like a diorama where you can see how the High Line new landscape is being constructed. It's a glass railing that goes through the edge. And the idea with the access points, where we could, um, where the, this is the only place where the city actually owned underneath the High Line. All of the High Line basically was only owned, the High Line itself, and an easement of the High Line, but everything underneath it was privately owned. So where we could, we tried to make a very slow stair that would allow you to sort of leave the frenetic pace of the city behind and enter an entirely new, sort of unique experience up above. That meant you had to cut um, certain beams in the structure itself, and then this is the, the finished design. They were a weathered steel and glass railing, and the idea was you would sort of enter through the can canopy of the trees. And then there's a series, of, so those are all the sort of consistent elements, and it was very important to us that the High Line read as a line, that it not be sort of cut up into a series of um, different types of spaces. We, you know, part of its power was really that it was this singular sort of line that cut through the city, and the city was a lot of the diversity around it. So there are a number of features that work within those consistent elements at particular moments or areas, and this is one of them. It's called the Sun Deck. It's one of the most popular spots. Um, there are these huge sort of chaise lounges and big sofa benches that are aligned along one of the curves of the rail track. And, um, you know, at first we sort of were doing these little drawings where we kind of showed how people would use them, but we had no idea what was going to happen here. And you can see some of them even have wheels on the bottom so that you can actually move them closer to someone or move them away from someone if you like. Um, this is a view from above, and I actually like some of the aerial views because they actually, you, you really see it. It's not just a plan view. You know, as a designer, you're working a lot in plan view, but no one ever sees that. But because there are all these buildings that are looking down on the High Line, you actually do sort of see it um, from that perspective as well. And on a sunny day, this is one of the most popular spots on the line, um, and you can see people using it in so many different ways all, all together. I've seen art classes out there, I've seen sunbathers, et cetera. Sometimes they even move it to the, to the ground. 
Uh, the Northern Spur Preserve is one of the other features. Um, this is, there's two spurs, you can see them in this photograph, that actually were where um, trains would run into the adjacent buildings. Um, this was an area where we sort of wanted to leave it inaccessible, so the idea was just to create this garden on the pier with a small overlook um, so that you can, you can sort of see it, but a lot of the species there were reminiscent of the existing species, natives, that we had found up there um, before all of that was taken away. The Chelsea Market Tunnel, um, which Robert showed you the, Sp the Spencer Finch piece, the idea is that there would be rotating public art events in this tunnel. It's also used for vending, cafe, et cetera. And of course the night effect is spectacular. The 10th Avenue Square, which is one of the sort of also well-loved spots. Um, this is hovering right over 10th Avenue. It was the thickest point of the High Line, so we could actually cut into it and create an amphitheater. Um, and here it is, you can see that amphitheater moving down. It was actually a square. This is where they used to wash the, the terrains off. And you can see the thickness of the beams and them laying in the amphitheater base. And the idea was then to remove the front part so you would have this glass window. And that not only allowed you to have an unusual view up 10th Avenue, but it actually gave the High Line a presence on the street. When the High Line was built, it was meant to recede. Nobody was supposed to see it. Um, in fact, a lot of people, when I first started saying I was working on the High Line, they were like, what's that? I live right there. I don't even know what it is. Um, I've never seen it before. And this kind of gave the High Line back its kind of presence on the street it becomes its own kind of viewing platform. People uh, do do lots of fun things up there. <laughs> They're in at the Standard Hotel, which I'm sure some of you have heard about. <laughs> but it's kind of great. You see like the windows below kind of selling things and then the windows above. And the plants itself have become one of the most popular features of the park. Um, I've actually seen probably 20 people take a photograph of themselves with this plant. Um, it's, this is a liatris, it's a, a blazing prairie star. And it's, it's really funny, people are always asking about it. Um, the Friends of the Highline just put out a plant guide just because so many people, they haven't asked the gardener questions on their website because um, so many people are interested. Um, we've been talking about developing kind of seed packets for your own garden. Um, some of the features in section two, which is currently under construction, one is the only turf area, but it's got a twist. <laughs> it's turf with a twist. Um, it's a lawn area and it actually peels up. And so you have the sort of elevated lawn right over 23rd Street. And what we're calling the woodland flyover, which is where all of the paving actually becomes a grating that you can see through and it lifts up off the ground and you're actually in the canopy of, of trees. This was in an area that actually, because there's, you can see, there's two tall buildings on either side. And so all of, it was a very woody area of the line. There was this microclimate where all of the trees that were there were just trying to catch the light. So they were growing really tall. Um, so the idea was to sort of use that microclimate, but change it to this, this flyover area. And then finally, the end terminus. Um, we always wanted to kind of cut away and reveal the structure at some point because the structure itself is so unique and interesting. Um, and this was a good spot, not only because it's a terminus and it kind of ends the line, but actually all of the concrete there was in really bad shape. So they had to remove it anyway. So the idea was to create a viewing platform on top of it. You're, you're basically straddling 30th Street at this, at this point. And Robert showed you a lot of the programming, but I sort of like to end with this slide because, you know, there was only a certain amount that we could envision and really how people are using it is beyond, I mean, people, I always think that these are like renderings that we did in the office, but they're not. I mean, there are stargazers out on the High Line <laughs> and there's a cabaret singer who is on her fire escape every night who does a performance and it's... It, it's pretty amazing. So it, it's sort of become, in its only short year, a well-loved um, place in the city, and it's, it's brought back the idea of promenading back to parks. It used to be a big 
part of parks you would go to be seen you'd kind of do your promenade um, and then that no longer sort of happened and when people go up there they really they do the entire journey um, you know people always ask me what my favorite spot is on the line and it's really it's much more about the walk um, and really starting from one place and going to the other um, I have a, if we have time, I know we were running a little late, there was like a five minute video that kind of shows the whole design that we were going to run. Um, and it's just a good recap. You can see the full Highline um, sections one and two. And it does a, it does a quick recap of the the history too. This was also produced by friends in the Highline. I have to say, not just because Robert's here, but one of the savviest clients I've ever worked with. So here you see the elevated railroad being built in the 1930s as part of the West Side Improvement Plan. The trains running on it until 1980. The sort of abandoned landscape taking root, them chopping off the end. And then we start going through the design and this will sort of show you um, starting from the southern end at Gansevoort. Moving north, here we are at 14th Street, another stair and entry. And this is the sun deck um, and water feature area, which is currently under construction, I think about to open any day now. That's the Chelsea Market. Um, these are the Northern Spur and the 10th Avenue Square. And these are the Chelsea Gardens, which is really the sort of narrow strip at the end that has some of the most amazing plant species. Then this is starting in section two. This is that 23rd Street lawn, peel-up lawn, and seating step area with an access point. And then we're going to move into the flyover, which is actually three blocks long, It's a because it, it slowly has to ramp up to code. I sort of didn't bore you with all of those details, but it was very difficult to, I think originally they wanted to have eight foot high fences on all sides of the High Line. And now we're, we're hitting 30th Street. This is the sort of long curve, um, a new access point, and then the cutout and viewing platform on the end. The rest just goes through a series of images, but you could probably pause it and we'll move to question, questions and answers. <laughs> So again, we have uh, the ushers in the aisle with microphones and uh, thank you, Lisa and Robert. Um, I'm a little bit blinded, but <laughs> I can try to pick out the first person. Are we ready? Uh, questions? There's one back here. They're coming right behind you. There you go. Um, is it on? I'm, I'm wondering if uh, you feel like the High Line is already starting to impact um, the culture of New York and, in a sense, making them more adventurous? I, I, I hope so. <laughs> I would say so. I mean, it definitely is changing behaviors. I mean, you know, you, you were talking about the promenading. One of the things I noticed early on is you see people holding hands, which I don't know if that's adventuresome, but... <laughs> and you just, you realize you don't see that in New York. I never see people holding hands. But up there, there's this sort of different feeling that I think it gives people. Um, people um, always say that 
you know, when we said we wanted to design a slow space, I've heard numerous times where they'll go up and they'll say, I actually, I really slow down when I'm up here. I, I change my pace. Um, but I also think this was a big risk for the parks department. Um, they took on a lot of things that they usually don't do. Everything you saw up there, I mean, it might seem simple, and that's part of the magic of the design. I think it is simple on one extent, but it's custom paving, custom lighting, custom planting, custom furnishing. These, you know, parks departments usually have standards um, for reasons, and they usually, you know, keep those standards, and they don't do custom things. So I think that was a big a big thing and now Brooklyn Bridge Park just opened and other parks are opening up in the city and I think they're taking a lot more risks. Just, I'm just curious, has it attracted any new like species of animals or birds or anything like that? Bees, that kind of thing? Well, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, bees up there. Our, our head of, our hort um, of, of operations and horticulture, Pat Kalina, was up there and he overheard someone talking about that it was amazing how that he, they, no one could see the little speakers where we were piping in the cricket noises. <laughs> because I couldn't you, believe it was real. You don't, I mean, you probably hear crickets here in New York. You never hear crickets. There, there's lots of, I mean, even from, you know, actually even in the existing kind of self-sown landscape, you would see a couple kind of things, but there's butterflies, um, birds. And, and mice, which I was concerned about because you normally don't want to see, but they're actually field mice, and they eat the little Country grains. <laughs> or that's what they told me, maybe to make me not worry that we had rats. But hi, I, you didn't mention how much the demolition cost would have been because uh, I'm a preservationist, and people seem to forget about how much it costs to tear something down and all they do is complain about how much it would cost to restore something because I think in that neighborhood, just the way that um, is constructed, to tear that down, I bet that would have been unbelievably expensive. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, we never got a reliable, there were estimates all over the place from the lowest, which we thought was almost impossible, was 10 million because it's over 22 streets that are working. So, you know, we got another estimate that it said it would cost $60 million to demolish. So, it's a great, it's a good point. Thanks. Um, I'm wondering, does the Friends or does the Highline benefit at all when a project like the Standard straddles over it for airspace rights or anything like that? Yeah, it's, um, the, the zoning that I showed you of the transfer of development rights, it ended at 16th Street. Um, the community, as part of that rezoning, it also, uh, what was primarily manufacturing became residential and mixed use. Um, the, the community didn't want to extend that into the meat market because they didn't want uh, any residential use there because they were worried it would, it would push out the meat market, which was pushed out anyway. But um, so they didn't want that. So that I rezoning. Thought the Whitney is having a, a basement floor for meat market. What? I thought the Whitney is required to have a basement floor for no, <laughs> meat market. That didn't. That it was the Dia was. was going to be a good art slash meat market yeah. hybrid use. <laughs> it was originally the Dia Museum was originally going there, and there was talk about that. But um, they so they they did, they they could build over it as of right. Um, to the to the north where we rezoned, we prohibited anybody from building over it. But to the south, it's as of right, and that hotel um, in manufacturing, there's no height limit, and hotels are as of right in manufacturing, so they didn't need any approval. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that said, though, I mean the the architects Polshek, um, you know, did talk to us at numerous times and they were interested in sort of um, getting our feedback. We weren't tied to anything. It was technically out of our scope, but they actually sensitively tried to raise the height of the building and narrow the building, which which makes a big difference. Because it's that a area. thirty foot easement. They could have it could have been just thirty feet off, which I think it's like sixty or seventy yeah. feet above. Um, the other thing we tried to do this a little related, one of the big I mean we've had I, we've had many failures of things we've tried to do, but one of the biggest was Last year, we tried to do a bid, a business improvement district, where we were going to tax uh, businesses and residents that live in the neighborhood because they're benefiting from the High Line. And even though we had over 70% of all the, the residents and, and businesses in favor of it, um, and we launched it right after we opened when, you know, it was very popular, 
Um, it was it was put down. And the, the New York Post ran I don't know three editorials against it. It got branded a highline tax. Became very polarizing. We pulled we we pulled the the idea. So right now we don't really directly benefit monetarily from all the value we're creating um, around the, the only thing I think that is kind of direct but is just uh, where you have a public access point in a private development they pay for that access point we don't have any of them yeah. yet I mean we there's people that have wanted to do it but they haven't they don't want to pay for it so we <laughs> don't have any yet hi uh, I had a question about, uh, you, you say that the access with slow stairs about every two blocks, uh, where do you provide the handicap accessibility and are you seeing lots of people in wheelchairs and Actually, yes, people? there are elevators. Um, there is an elevator at 14th Street, at 16th Street. There will be one at the Gansevoort Street um, when the Whitney opens, they're providing an elevator. And, um, there will be one at 23rd Street, at 30th Street, so. Well, so are they as often as the slow stairs? Yes, the two blocks? they're usually oh. paired. Um, there's one or two locations in between them where you have, basically it's a switchback stair, it's not a slow stair because you, can, you only have the sidewalk. You showed the map with all of the many development things that were going on in the general vicinity, could you give us some idea of what what's actually happening in those developments and the way in which those developments either connect to or don't connect to the High Line? Yeah, there are all kinds. I mean, there's hotels like the Standard, the Whitney's Museum, but a lot, most of them are new residential. Um, some are commercial, but mostly is residential. Um, and to Lisa's point, there, there's a, a good example of a residential building that was built right next to the High Line. Um, as part of the rezoning, they were actually required to build us a stair and elevator and bathrooms. And they could connect, but we haven't. What we don't want is to have any connection right onto the High Line, um, because we don't want people walking along and then there's a door and only some people have a key. So if you want to have access, you have to do it off the High Line. And you have to, to, to make a contribution to the maintenance, which no one has agreed to. So right now, there, no one, there's no other access besides the public stairs and, and elevators. Thank you very much for your presentations. They were excellent and I'm inspired. I'm interested to know, um, it's overwhelming when you started this um, to look ahead and think that you could make this happen. And I'm wondering, what was the turning point? I mean, kind of this $100 million project, nobody's on your side. It's just this abandoned place. What what kind of was the turning point in the process of making it happen? Yeah, I don't. I mean, uh, I get asked that a, a lot, and there really was no one turning point. I mean, I, I thought the whole thing was going to collapse probably maybe two years ago. Still, I, I it's still amazing that it actually happened. And I mean, you know, I think the biggest surprise for me is I, you know, when someone gave us fifty dollars the first year in 1999, <laughs> you know, was that that was a miracle. But, you know, I mean, it was those small, it was, it was biting, it, it, again, it's intimidating when you look at the 150 million, but the first thing we did was we raised $5,000 for a brochure. Uh, then we had to raise um, se several thousand dollars for legal fees. Um, and then we, you know, we wanted to do a design competition. We wanted to do another publication. Then we needed to design a website. So it was these small increments. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so, what I love about the Highline is when we opened, we, we printed little pens that said, I built the Highline. And, you know, it, it, yeah. it, and it's a lot, you know, a Collective, lot of people. you know. It, and, you know, and I mean, Lisa built the Highline, but a lot of people um, that gave $5 or signed up for an email newsletter, they felt like they built the Highline, not just, you know, we have donors, great donors, Barry Diller, Diamond from Versburg, gave $15 million. I mean, they, they built the Highline. <laughs> um, but the people... <laughs> But the other, you know, it, it wasn't, it, it would never have gotten to that point where we needed that if other people hadn't come along. And that's what I think, again, is so exciting about what's happening here, is people are thinking about that. You know, y'all did it, I don't over 150 years ago here, you know, to create your original park system. But, you know, it's not just about um, the wealthiest people coming, you know, together to, to put in that that big money. It, it's, it can be a bottom up and that's, I have three goals for the Highline. One, that it's a well-loved park, that 
It can be beautiful design, it can be very fancy, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. There's a lot of things that have great design uh, by amazing architects and landscape architects, but if they're not well-loved, it doesn't really matter. So one, that it's well-loved, um, and two, that it inspires other people that they can start these kind of projects. You don't, I mean, I'm not an architect, I'm not a landscape architect, I'm not a planner. My, the other co-founder, Joshua, was a travel writer. I mean, we, we had no background in this. And, and again, I think the most important thing was we raised the flag and other people with all these kind of expertise come along to help uh, make, it, make it happen. But that's, I mean, it's the same for us. We, in order for it to be successful, you know, there has to be a certain amount of stewardship, engagement, et cetera. So, you know, it's, and everyone does feel passionate about this. If anything, we always, because we had a multi-headed, client, it was Friends of the Highline, it was five groups from the city, it was every agency, federal, state, city, all the money, we had to deal with all those approvals. So, you know, it's it was a huge effort and everybody did come together to make it happen, but um, yeah, it was like little wins, <laughs> small little wins along the way. Um. What was each of your favorite components of the design that didn't actually make it into the final design and why did it get cut? The beach. <laughs> I mean, there was really only one thing. We had a show at MoMA of the, of the final designs and I remember someone um, coming to the exhibition they said, oh, well, these are great designs but what's really going to get built? Because I think people are so used to seeing, you know, these these exhibitions and but then it gets whittled down and it doesn't really and the only thing we lost from that exhibition was a a, a pool it was going to be a glass bottom pool that was going to be over 14th street and um it just got costed out and i think i'm sort of i mean sort of thankful it did the, the the water feature that we have which is sort of simple still doesn't work <laughs> So, you know, a year later, and double what it, we thought it was Not to mention, I think the Not Department of Transportation fault. had a heart attack when they were like, <laughs> people are going to look up in an intersection and see people swimming, and <laughs> they're gonna be tra there's going to be Death Avenue again. <laughs> you, had, you had mentioned that you were okay with um, people kind of interacting with the plantings. But I actually visited in April, and there are these little um, cords they that keep, are oh, keeping yeah. everyone off of the off of the plantings now. What do you feel about that? And do you feel that that is uh, kind of against what you wanted to have happen on the space? Well, it's a tricky. There's always been this issue of the kind of plant protection, and um, a lot of the species we chose actually have cascading effects. So they're planted on the side, but they actually kind of drape over the line. Um, a lot of those cords that you saw, um, some of them is right after we cut back plants and then they're growing in again. And so when they're still kind of, we, we basically try not to cut back the plants until the very spring. So you were probably there right when that happened. Um, usually you cut them back in the winter. We wanted people to actually experience the winter growth and the whole life cycle of the plant. So they were just cut back, they put in, um, you know the different wires, and then once it grows in, hopefully they can remove them. But and you don't, you never really wanted people to interact, like step on the plant. It's I mean, more, it's more appreciate. No, <laughs> we do not. We <laughs> we do not want them to step on the plants. Um, but the idea is that it's an immersive environment. So when you're walking, you feel like you're in the plants versus feeling like you're next to the plants. But it's also training people. Not we have this gravel mulch, which looks great. But it, when people see the gravel mulch, they think, oh, I can walk on the gravel. You know, I'm not walking on the plants, but that, it, it kills the roots. And we, so in certain places, we, we're trying to train. I mean, ultimately, we love to get back to the place where we don't have any of those, those railings. Um, but again, this is something that, I mean, this was a huge battle with the Parks Department. I, there's no park in New York where you don't have a barrier, you know, between you and the plants. I mean, there's always a fence or some kind of... Um, so that that was a big, a it big was. hurdle. And I mean, and even I mean, most people you'll, with well-loved spaces, people really do respect the space. So, you know, most people try to respect that. But it's a narrow, it's a narrow space, and it happens. So, you know, we're just trying, as Robert said, to kind of train people. And there's lots of gardeners doing work, and they are constantly asking, you know, answering questions and telling people things. So it, it's a, it's a, it's not a rules thing it's like you're constantly saying hey you know that species actually needs this or needs that and people are learning a lot about it i think we can take one more question i think someone has the mic yeah could you talk a little bit more about you just mentioned plant hurdles i'm over here 
Um, um, uh, specifically trees and shrubs, like the special concerns for planting trees on structure, types of species. Did, sure. Were you able to utilize any existing trees? Um, we There were only a few existing trees and none of them made it. Um, but there's a lot of native species. We used a lot of sumac, birch, um, service berry. Um, there actually is a, a full species uh, list, I think, on, on the Friends of the Highline website. But um, the idea was really to do multi-stem, wild, um, and plant them in thickets. So you'll see they're really grown in, um, you know, very close together. And then in the areas where we actually have larger trees, we have steel planters so that you get three feet of soil. Um, and or we bermed up the soil to accommodate for the root balls. But they'll never grow. I mean, we, we and, you know, to our, whatever, whatever it is, the thing is that landscape architects are working on structure all the time now. Um, it's very common practice. So we're constantly working with, you know, highly engineered soil specifications, lightweight soil specifications, um, irrigation systems, um, you know, the green roof systems, retaining water, all of that. So, and we just try to pick species that are highly adaptable. Okay, I just wanted to remind people of the, there's a reception that'll take place on the plaza, um, right outside, um, outdoor at our outdoor bar. And uh, don't forget the last of the lectures, which is uh, Lori Olin, a very famous landscape architect. We'll be talking about finding lost spaces, and that'll be at the U, at the College of Design on July 15th. Please help me thank Lisa and Robert, and thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs>